Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar and thanks for joining our digital week. How can companies and rather traditional industries make the most of digitalization? How can they deal with the challenges? And what can we learn from the insurance industry? My name is Friederike Rieder and I'm very happy to discuss these questions with my guest today, Alexander Brown. He's professor at our Institute for Insurance Economics. Before I invite him in, just my two usual remarks. We will take this session and send you the link to the recording as well as to the slides sometime next week. Also, the presentation will last around 30 minutes and we'll happily discuss your questions afterwards. So please send us many questions by using the F&A or Q&A field in your Zoom program. So now I would like to welcome Alex. Can you please turn on your video and audio? There you are. Hello, welcome hi. Alex. You're in Bavaria now, teaching executives from the insurance industry. Is that That's correct, correct yes. Uh, we are in Hohenkammer, which is the Academy of Munich Re. And yeah, we have one of our programs running here this week. So thanks for taking the time. I will turn my video off and the floor and the screen is yours. And dear viewers, have an insightful lunch break. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Federica, and uh, welcome everyone to this lunch break seminar or webinar. Uh, throughout the next 30 minutes, I would like to discuss the key challenges that we face in the insurance industry in the course of digital transformation, and then try to carve out learnings that may be helpful for the situation in your specific industry. The insurance industry currently finds itself in a period uh, of rapidly accelerating change and mounting pressures from several sides. And as the webinar title indicates, in order to ensure future success, a single strategic response is not sufficient. So instead, several innovation options have to be explored and combined, and handling them all simultaneously calls for multi-handedness of the organization, an extension of the classical ambidexterity paradigm, and um, as we believe, a new success factor for the digital age. So uh, having said that, let's, uh, let's start. Let's try to switch on the presentation here. Just bear with me for one second. I hope you can all see this. Um, and uh, yeah, well, let's start with a diagnosis. So here we have the classical innovator's dilemma, uh, which has been, you know, coined by Clayton Christensen. You can see uh, the S curves on the left hand side. Uh, usually business models or companies get founded as a startup. Uh, you have a new idea and you try to implement it and it, it will start growing and at some point become an established business. And then later on, potentially much later on, uh, you will enter a period of stagnation and you know, potentially even exhaustion of your business model. Uh, and Christensen says that, uh, you know, there is a dilemma zone that you enter before exhaustion actually happens. And in, in that dilemma zone, you have to decide as a company uh, how you're going to deal with the potential problem of reaching the end of your curve. Uh, you are in the innovator's dilemma. On the one hand side, you will have to take care of your current legacy business. You cannot neglect that. But on the other hand, you have to free up enough, uh, you know, resources and enough energy to think about where things will go in the future, what a new S-curve could look like. And um, you know, history and experience has shown that many companies, many industries tend to fail. And digital transformation is basically the innovator's dilemma all over again. We all know something is going on and we need to adapt, but nobody really knows in which direction. So the question is, is it all fine in the insurance industry? And you could think that if you look at certain metrics, if you look at the stable results over the last years, particularly in the Swiss market, we have high capital levels, we have stable dividends, or some companies even have been increasing the dividends, uh, but that could be a mixed signal, right? So there is a financial theory that tells us uh, that you should be looking for positive net present value projects that you should conduct to actually increase shareholder value. And giving back money in the form of dividends uh, when you're not really growing, could be an indication that you're just running out of ideas. 
So you rather give the money back to your shareholders instead of investing it in positive NPV projects and increased shareholder value. So you could tell a different story by looking at uh, stagnation in revenues and policy sales for quite some time now. And, you know, we talk about growth. It's very little growth actually compared to other industries and other markets. We have stagnation in insurance penetration over a decade or so, um, both in life and non-life, and that goes not just for Switzerland, for many other developed markets as well. Stagnation in uh, the average number of policies per household. And what you also see, I think this is a figure from Germany, where the number of brokers and tied agents has actually decreased substantially since uh, 2011. So that tells a different story uh, that tells us that, you know, that indicates that something is going on in the background and we may have to think about actual new S curves and uh, business models. So it's easy to deceive yourself uh, into a false sense of security if you look at the wrong metrics, right? So we should really be careful and potentially one, we are in the dilemma zone and we have to take the time that, we, that, that is left to think about new approaches. So in the insurance industry, as you can see on this slide, there is a way to empirically estimate the S-curve, uh, which has been presented by Swiss Re several years ago. And uh, on the y-axis, you would plot the premiums as a percentage of GDP, which we call insurance penetration. And on the horizontal axis, you would have GDP per capita, which is a measure for the wealth in a society. And as you can see, uh, in, at the lower end of the S-curve, we have a lot of poor societies or economies and then uh, the more developed markets at the upper end. So if you think about this, there is a, a fundamental economic reason why insurance will reach the end of its curve at some point. And it's pretty simple. If you are a poor society, people are on the lower levels of the, the, the need hierarchy. They have to take care of shelter, food, things like that. So there are not a lot of assets and possessions to be insured. Uh, and that means there is, you know, the society is just too poor for insurance. As wealth increases, you will enter a period of rapid growth in uh, the insurance market as well, as we see in China, for example, right now. It's one of the major growth markets in the insurance industry too, like in, other, in many other industries, because all, all of a sudden people will be able to afford things, right? They get a car, a home, you know, potentially a camera, things like that. And all of this can be uh, covered by insurance. But then at some point, you will reach saturation simply for the reason that at some point, most of your things or all of your things will be insured and all of your risks, you know, not just objects, but also your health risks uh, and your life risks and things like that. So it, there is a reason to believe that there's a fundamental economic cap on growth in insurance markets in developed economies. It's, it's hard to believe that unless you discover a major new risk pool that you can actually insure that you should grow above the rate of the overall economy. So then it becomes a game of capturing market share uh, and fierce competition between different players in the market. So for other industries, you may try and think about a similar fundamental economic reason why there is an S-curve and why you are probably reaching uh, the flattening area towards the end of the S-curve. Then in the next step, what tends to happen is you have to think about someone coming in and as I put it here, rocking the boat. So some threat uh, actually coming into play towards the end of your S-curve. And who could that be? Well, in the last years, we have been discussing a lot the possibility that this could be startups uh, that anticipate future customer needs, bring in new technology, create new business models, and, and, and at some point could cause disruption of the whole insurance industry. I think at this point, we can say that has not happened and probably not going to happen anytime soon. Doesn't mean that we don't have to uh, keep this in mind and uh, basically closely follow what's going on in the insurance tech space. Another threat that has been discussed um, several times and is still being discussed is big tech, the so-called GFAA, GAFA companies uh, that could come in, capture the client interface in insurance and basically therefore have the power in this market. And that is not completely off limits because 
companies like Google are still are already partially occupying the, the, the customer interface because in, in certain contested markets, let's say motor insurance, for example, in Germany, uh, towards the end of the year, when everyone is changing their contracts from one company to another, uh, buying leads from Google is, is, is going to get really expensive. So it's clear that most people uh, research online and then purchase offline, but to, have, to be present there, you will have to uh, compensate Google handsomely. Uh, so they already have a major say in who gets leads uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the insurance market. And then finally, something that tends to be overlooked is in transformed incumbents. So if someone has done their homework better than you have, is, uh, has digitized earlier on, has played some of those strategic options that we'll discuss um, in the next minutes, this could become a major threat as well. So here is an example from the insurance industry. It's um, the biggest insurance company in the world, uh, Ping An, a Chinese insurer that started in the 80s and 90s as a classical insurance company, but now is a fully digitized end-to-end, -end, you would say a tech insurance company. So there's more tech than insurance inside here. It has 179 million customers, uh, operates five ecosystems. We'll get back to what an ecosystem in this context um, is uh, later on. And if you look at the, the composition of its staff, of its workforce, it's highly relying on a type of skills that we don't have in the insurance industry naturally. 22,000 IT developers and 500 plus data scientists that are more people with that skill set that you know, companies in Switzerland like Helvetia or Bauas really have employees. And they have over 2,000 global uh, patents that they sell to other industries as well. So you can see here, it's a transformed insurance company that has adopted digital innovation as its core DNA. So it's a completely new player we are looking at here. And obviously this is something that you know, slower players will have to cope with at some point, potentially. Or it could be someone else from a completely different industry. It's also not completely unthinkable that from the car industry, someone may think about trying to sell insurance at the same time, and we'll get back to that later on. So uh, here we have a first poll, um, and I would like to know uh, which industry you are from and uh, who you think poses the most significant threat to your industry. So is it, a, is it startups, is it big tech? transformed incumbents or someone else from a completely different, different industry. Okay, so the poll window just popped up and I look at it, let's see. I can't see the polls coming in. Oh, I think I have to vote myself, right? No. says hosts and panelists cannot vote. <laughs> I'm not allowed to vote myself, okay. So uh, that's interesting. Okay, now I see the results. So we have a lot of banking and insurance, that's not surprising. Uh, and then we have IT, information technology, uh, healthcare, and industrial. So it's actually a nicely balanced mix with uh, a little bit of a, um, an overweight in insurance. And it's also interesting to see that Oh, wow. Yeah. So we see that startups, big tech and transformed incumbents play a role in all of your industries as well. So we have a lot of commonalities here and I'm, I'm hoping to be able to play out some more commonalities in the, in the course of this uh, discussion here. And big tech has the highest, uh, the highest percentage. So that's really encouraging to see that, you know, across industries, we're seemingly dealing with similar issues in the course uh, and in the context of digital transformation. Okay, so let me click this away and go on. Okay, so once you have done this um, diagnosis, uh, the next step is think about potential disruption scenarios. And disruption always sounds like something, yeah, it's never going to happen. Catastrophic loss in revenues, how should that be? Well, in insurance, there are a couple of reasons why that could actually become reality in certain business lines. One is sharing or access. 
which means that you try to make much better use of underutilized assets. Uh, cars, for example. There are many studies out there that show that cars are being used about 10% of the time on average. So 90% of the time cars are parked out there just sitting around idle. If you think about your own car, um, at least for myself, that, 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 that is exactly true. So uh, I do, don't use it most of the time, so why not try and you know, lend it to someone so that they can use it while you are not using. So that's the idea of sharing. Or in the future, there may be a possibility to just pay a subscription fee and a centralized provider will actually grant you access to mobility to cars um, so that you can use them whenever you need them. What that implies is simply if we use the cars that are available to a much higher capacity, much higher extent, in the end, it, it means we'd simply need much less cars. And if you reduce, let's say, the amount of cars in an economy from 10 million to 100,000, you can imagine what that implies if you are in the business of insuring cars. Now it happens to be that car insurance is the major product, the major business line for insurance companies in almost any market. So non-life, about 30 to 40% of revenues come from car insurance or sometimes even more. Now, this is devastating if you all of a sudden lose uh, the, the possibility to, to insure those cars. And this is a disruption scenario that car manufacturers are actually thinking about as well. It's not just for the insurance industry because uh, the need for less cars implies that if you manufacture and sell cars, your market will basically uh, you know, be substantially reduced as well in the future. A second scenario that we have to think about in insurance is prevention. Because we see digital technology coming in, helping us to actually prevent risks where we weren't able to prevent them in the past. Prevention meaning we reduce the frequency and severity of an event that could happen. So I can give you an example here. Uh, there is a popular insurance product, for example, in the German market, uh, which is insurance against leakage from pipes in your building which could destroy, the water could destroy your belongings in your apartment. Now, there is technology, uh, devices you can attach to the central water supply, and it comes with sensors in the rooms and in the pipes. So it, it can actually detect a, a pressure loss in the pipes, and it can detect um, an, an increase in humidity in your uh, home. And at some threshold level, it will simply shut off the main water supply. And that implies that, you know, if it works perfectly, and such a loss from water leakage cannot occur anymore. And therefore, there's no need to insure this loss anymore. If the risk is removed or at least you know, uh, significantly lowered, uh, potentially people will say, I don't need insurance against this anymore. So what, what are you going to do if, if you were selling these types of products? right? And the third one is disintermediation through new technologies such as blockchain, which enable to conduct transactions directly peer to peer from one counterparty to another without an intermediary sitting in the middle and basically matching up uh, supply and demand in this market. Uh, so for insurance, that means, you know, if there would be a way to directly bring together risk and capital, uh, then, you know, you wouldn't theoretically need an insurance company as an intermediary in the middle. Uh, and so that's clearly a, a disruptive scenario. And it could also be disruptive for other industries in which you have a lot of intermediaries, brokers, uh, banks, and so forth. So that's really something to be uh, you know, observed over potentially the mid to long term though. Okay, so you have to ask yourself in your industry, what are potential scenarios like this that could cause a catas catastrophic loss in revenues? Now we come to the point where we need to think about reactions, right? Responses, how do we deal with this situation? And um, well, there's this classical paradigm of ambidexterity, which says if you are uh, in a situation like the innovator's dilemma, and you have to take care of your uh, classical business, your legacy business, you have to exploit that uh, with one hand. And then on, with the other hand, you have to explore new ways, new directions, uh, you have to innovate, and try to reach a new S-curve, potentially even create a new S-curve. So what we've been discussing a lot is in the insurance industry, challenges are so manifold that maybe 
we require an extension of this ambidexterity paradigm into multi-handedness, right? So you, you have so many balls that you need to uh, keep in the air by juggling that you need more than one hand. Uh, so uh, what you could say is, well, we have to take care of our legacy business because it's still running well in, uh, in many markets. We're still earning money, um, so that we can't neglect that. But apart from that, we really need to digitize the value chain. It's high time for several reasons. Uh, we'll get back to that uh, in a few minutes. You need to digitize your value chain. You need to think about uh, you know, joining ecosystems, building ecosystems, becoming part of ecosystems. Also, we'll get back to that uh, in, in one or two minutes. And the whole area of business model innovation, obviously, which we know is a major way out of the, of the dilemma. Uh, here um, also in the insurance industry. Okay, so insurance industry have understood uh, that there are several directions that need to be pursued uh, at the same time and the weighting really depends on what your strategic objectives are. So there's no general way to say everyone should uh, equally weight these options. Um, it really depends on your specific situation, but they're all worth uh, actually exploring and actually keeping in mind. Let's go through them one by one. So digitization of the, the value chain, what does it actually mean, right? So you have your classical, this is, this is a stylized, very short version of an insurance value chain. You know, in reality, you have many more steps in between, but you could say it all starts with sales. Today, we are heavily relying still on, uh, you know, uh, tied agents and brokers selling in a face-to-face -face situation. Uh, and then you have underwriting where there's still a lot of, uh, you know, uh, legwork involved. Um, we don't have a high degree automation in some cases yet. And then uh, claims which potentially involves paperwork. So simple to say, we should, you know, automate this by applying things like blockchain, AI, and IoT. And that can really help automating uh, the value chain. But then a major problem is that most insurance companies nowadays are still working with uh, highly outdated IT systems where you really have to ask yourself if it's even possible, uh, even if you take a lot of resources uh, to digitize this value chain or if, it, if you would really be better off to start from scratch, start with a completely new digital company on the green field and then at some point just switch over because the effort involved in digitizing a highly uh, outdated IT landscape may just be too great. So this is a really challenging question for some companies. It may even become one of the decisive factors. So some companies may even not be able to digitize their existing systems and may have to start from scratch. But if you master that, you could say, well, then it's good, it's all fine, I have automated and I have reduced costs, I have operational excellence. Well, it really doesn't stop there because digitization is not just about technology, it's also about people. And uh, you know, a, a company, also an insurance company, is not a machine, it is a social system. So what you actually need to think about as well is not just legacy systems, it's legacy culture as well. So up, up here on the right-hand side, you see a picture that I've taken from a German TV series. Some of you might know it. It's a, it's a comedy type TV series about the everyday life in a, a mid-sized German insurance company. Obviously, it's a hypothetical company. It doesn't exist in reality. But uh, it's, it's very interesting to look at this. It's comedy, so it's exaggerated. But as everything, it has a, tr a little bit of a true core, right? So if you look at the people here, uh, the, the series is called Stromberg because this guy here in the middle, his name is Bernd Stromberg and he heads up the claims handling department in this insurance company. And if you think about, you know, the way they're dressed and you can, you can easily think about how the, this, you know, department works, how they look like. If you want to digitize with these people, it's going to be a major effort in the transformation of the culture. Plus, if you have such a culture, it's gonna be very difficult to attract the people that you need in terms of the skill shift, uh, which are IT developers and, and data scientists and so forth, because they will, you know, you will be competing in the labor market with other players such as Google or fancy startups that are actually looking for the exact same talent. So maybe we have to shift and say a major 
force of competition is not only going to be on our product market, it's going to be on the labor market, right? And people tend to overlook that and by getting so concentrated on, on the IT side and potentially on, 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 on sales as well. So this is really a major factor that probably most likely applies to many other industries as well. If you experience a skill shift in your, in your industry, you have to ask yourself the exact same question. How am I going to attract these people that I need to create my digital value chain if Google wants them as well? Or if a, a very nice startup like, you know, let's say Lemonade in the insurance industry wants them as well. Ecosystems, you have to ask yourself as an insurance company, which role do you want to play? Uh, an ecosystem is a network of companies uh, that come together to form a joint value proposition for the customer. So they try to address more than one need at once. Uh, it's like a bundling, uh, a, a very nice package, a solution for the client rather than just the product. And they tend to be orchestrated by a major player who has a platform that is a two-sided market. So it brings together customers on one side uh, with you know, those companies that actually provide the goods and services for the ecosystem on the other side. And um, now many insurance companies are thinking about, should I become an orchestrator? Should I become a participant? What are the differences, right? So uh, the problem is, it's really high, highly unlikely for many insurance companies that, that they can actually become an orchestrator for a few simple reasons. Uh, the core competencies of an insurer are risk pricing, risk coverage. Uh, they, they tend to have very strong distribution networks in the classical sense, brick and mortar. And um, they have, some of them have strong brands, right? But an orchestrator in an ecosystem like what we're talking about here needs more capabilities, technical capabilities, fully digitized value chains, but above all, a platform with a high number of customers, but also a high number of touch points. And Insurers have a lot of customers, but they have no touch points, right? So the problem in insurance is you see your customers twice, once when they buy insurance and then a second time when they have a claim. But in between, usually you have silence for several years for a prolonged period of time. So it will be very difficult to actually become an orchestrator. If at all, it will involve a major business model transformation. You will have to be something completely else than you are right now. And you have to ask yourself if you have the resources to actually pull that off, right? So otherwise it's gonna be participant. And for a participant, again, we're back to digitizing the value chain because that, that's a completely different ball game here. There are no possibilities to, to differentiate yourself apart from price, from costs. You need to have very low costs because for the orchestrator, you can, he can easily substitute you, replace you with someone else who's offering the exact same service for a lower price. What does a strong platform look like? Um, this is one example from China. It's called WeChat. It's a chatting platform like WhatsApp who has um, realized really early on that they can do a lot more because they have the customer um, several million times per day. Uh, they have touch points, right? So they turned it into a platform. They uh, offered mini programs, as they call it, which by now have exceeded what you get on App Store. And above all, you can now buy goods and services through this platform. Tickets, uh, you know, for transportation, uh, concerts, you can buy fashion, you can buy food. And as you can see here, you can buy insurance as well. And by the way, you can send money too. You can just send money directly from one party to another. So that's not good news for banks as well. So this is an extremely strong platform. And if you think about becoming an orchestrator, like we do sometimes in the insurance industry, you really have to think about creating something like this. And uh, most of the time in, in every direction that you think you will find someone who has already done some, something like this. So it's really, it's really crucial to come up with uh, a proper plan if your decision is that you wanna be the, the orchestrator. Here's an, a different example involving insurance, and this is a participant example, and it can work quite well too. So you might have heard that IKEA is now selling insurance, but really it's not insurance by IKEA. Uh, it's an ecosystem approach. And we have Swiss Re, uh, the, one of the two major reinsurance companies in the world with its digital subsidiary IPTQ. Uh, and what they don't have is access to the customer and a strong customer facing brand. But what they have is a huge balance sheet, a lot of capital and very 
very good capabilities in risk selection and pricing and long-standing experience. So no Salesforce, no retail brand. What do you do? Well, you plug into the ecosystem of IKEA you use their customer touch points and they see their customers in their stores on a regular basis around the world. And on top of that, the customer has just bought his furniture. So at this point, at the so-called point of sale, he's most receptible for the idea that it may be useful to actually ensure what he has just bought. So that is one way that you can play it out. Plug into an ecosystem of a very strong retail brand and sell your insurance through there. But again, in the future, this will involve being very cost effective. Another example before we approach the finish line is subs subscription models in mobility. So uh, a lot of car manufacturers have started to offer you mobility packages. You pay a monthly fee and ex in exchange for that, you can take a different car every day. So you may want to have a van because you have a family excursion planned and the next day you change it against the convertible and it includes everything, maintenance, tire changes, uh, funding, and also insurance. So it's all taken care of by paying this one monthly fee. But that implies if you're an insurance company and you work with this ecosystem here, your product is invisible. It's completely embedded in the overall product offering. So there's no way that you can actually leverage your brand here. And um, well, if you think about that, uh, the customer is not gonna change his mobility package uh, saying, look, Porsche, um, I'm very sorry, but you have no AXA included in your package, AXA insurance, or let's say Zurich insurance or Allianz for that matter. The customer is simply not gonna do that. They're not gonna even care potentially about it. So that already shows how difficult it can be also to be a, part to a participant in these ecosystem uh, constructs. So for your industry, if you're from a different industry, uh, you potentially take a way to think about your own product offerings and what being a participant means in an ecosystem means for the visibility that your brand has. Are you going to lose brand value uh, if you participate as a, um, you know, a, someone who delivers products into the ecosystem. That brings me to the last uh, content slide um, to sum it all up. This is a holistic perspective from the insurance industry. Uh, we have uh, the hierarchy of needs here, different levels of needs of the customer that you can actually address. And we have the degree of satisfaction of those needs on the horizontal axis. And now let's say insurance starts here. We are satisfying the safety need. Uh, customers want protection uh, from insurance companies, but we're doing it, um, I've put low, right? Uh, we, we could satisfy that need in a better way. Uh, and let me point out why that is. So one way is you could digitize the value chain either partially, that's 1A here, or even fully to move on and satisfy the need in a better way. Still safety need, right? You're still satisfying the safety need, but you have a better user experience, faster turnaround times, all these kind of things that a digital technology will allow you to do. Um, then, you know, in a next step, what you could think of is, uh, this is called, this is what we call here, digitization is a process innovation. Well, you could now think about a product innovation. You could say, I don't want to be a payer of bills, as insurance companies are right now. I want to be a partner. I want to be someone who uh, gives advice and helps customers prevent losses from happening. So if you are able to become a, a prevention company to help your customers prevent the risk altogether, so then you will be able to satisfy the safety need on the highest possible level. Because again, if you think about it, if you ask a customer, do you want to have a loss and then an insurance company that is gonna pay for it, or do you want to have uh, the possibility to avoid that loss altogether? I think the answer is pretty clear. Nobody wants to experience the loss with all the negative aspects that are associated with it. So insurance can always be just the second best solution. What else can you do? Uh, option number three is also product innovation. You could try to enrich your offerings with uh, products that cover different needs such as physiological needs. That means food, sleep, shelter. So some health insurance companies are offering you know, advice in terms of the, the diet of their clients, in terms of physical activity, health. Uh, that's an option that you have. And then now we're approaching the idea of ecosystems. So 
uh, by the way, one thing that should be mentioned, right? So the arrows black and red, if you combine them, you have a product plus a, a process innovation, which is what we call a business in a, a business model innovation, right? So those two in, in one are business model innovation. Now, from this point on here, you could also say, look, I want to address a different level of needs, which I cannot do by being a pure insurance company. I want to plug into an ecosystem, let's say, for example, of a car manufacturer like Porsche. So having a subscription uh, model, having being sus subscribed to a Porsche mobility package is certainly something that is covering an individual or a steam need. So if you plug into that ecosystem and sell your insurance through, through that Porsche mobility package, it will create a pull effect uh, and can actually nicely increase your revenues uh, by being a participant here and take you on a different need level that you couldn't reach with your pure insurance product. And then you have the sort of most complex but also most rewarding alternative is try to build an ecosystem as uh, you know by yourself as an orchestrator covering all the different uh, levels of the need hierarchy uh, and having others that deliver their products into your ecosystem but again uh, that proves to be a very challenging option and it's it's, it's really not clear at this point uh, in the insurance industry and potentially in many other industries whether you know, some of the players are actually be able to um, are going to be able to, to to pull that off. So this brings me to the second poll, and this is also um, you know the 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 end of the presentation. We can then after the poll uh, actually go and uh, enter the discussion, the Q and A. What I would like to know is how far along are you in your industry, in your company, with your digital transformation efforts, and do the challenges that we have discussed right now apply to you as well? Uh, and do you think that there's some value in these in, in this, uh, thoughts, right? Okay, I can see the answers rolling in. Let me look at this. Uh, it's still bouncing around, but I can see that uh, a lot of uh, majority of companies or industries are on their way. Uh, and another, another high percentage is still early stage, which really matches what we experience in the insurance industry. Okay, here's the final result. So 52% are on their way, 5% are completely digital. Those are probably uh, the people uh, from the tech industry that we have in, in, in the participant uh, group. And then early stage, 40, 43%. So I think this is really what we experienced in insurance as well. And it's good to see that we're sort of in a similar situation here. Uh, and the challenges, uh, definitely, yes, 52%. Thank you very much. So that's good. That means, uh, you know, I, I could actually provide some, some thoughts that are interesting to you. And to a certain extent, uh, 43%. So I would say only a minority of 5% says our industry is completely different. Uh, and even it's, if it's completely different, there may still be value in looking at what other industries are doing uh, to cope with these challenges uh, of digital transformation. Okay, so I'll click this away. Uh, and that actually brings me to uh, the end of my presentation. And I guess we still have a little bit of time left for the discussion. Thank you, Alex. Um, would you like to stop your screen sharing? Then? Yes, let me do that for a second. Yeah. Um, okay. If you have questions, please send us more. Um, <clears throat> actually, which companies do you think do a good job in digitizing the core business and making it more efficient and at the same time build new disruptive companies? Do you have any examples? Well, the question is if uh, that relates to the insurance industry or to other industries. So um, uh, just in general, uh, well, we have examples from, from the insurance industry. It's, you know, since we work very closely with a lot of partners from the industry, it's very hard to mention uh, some and then don't mention others. But um, I can say that, you know, there's, there, there's definitely a variation in where, where companies stand in terms of digitization. So some have really um, a really good concept and a, I think a realistic match of what they want to achieve compared to their resources and their previous position. Uh, and interestingly, I think that's something that I should emphasize here is it's not always just the big players, right? So you would think that, uh, you know, the biggest companies that we have, which is Allianz and AXA and, and, and similar companies, they should be at the forefront and they are doing a really good job. But there are also smaller players in the insurance industry that have a very good concept uh, and they really know what they want to achieve and are pursuing that, you know, uh, very well, you know. And others, there are others that are more 
potentially spreading themselves too thin uh, because I think a key challenge here with what I said about multi-handedness is actually the weighting, right? How much weight do you put on the digitization of the value chain? How much on business model innovation? And how much on ecosystem building? And obviously, there these options are also uh, somewhat interlinked, and uh, that's that that's not an easy and an, an easy thing to do. Here's a follow-up question: um, Which percentage of today's leading companies will not survive because they are not able to make the change into the digital age? Do you have? Wow. That's a hard one. <laughs> uh, I think there's a, there, there's a quote, um, I'm not sure whether it was Winston Churchill, I think different people uh, are told to have said uh, the quote that, um, you know, pro uh, prognostics are really difficult, particularly uh, if they're about the future, right? So, um, well, it's, it's a percentage is really hard to name, but I, I, I believe there will be consolidation, okay? So, um, also in the insurance industry because, and there, there are also fundamental reasons for that because insurance is a business model that, that has advantages in size, right? So we are pooling risks and there's statistical rules that show that if your pool is, is larger, uh, you know, you can remove uncertainties and you can pinpoint the expected loss much better and your pricing and all this kind, these kind of things. So there is some advantage to size in insurance. Which will, which tells me that if you are mid-sized or smaller insurance companies and you do not have a clear concept where you went ahead, then consolidation consolidation will could potentially happen at some point, right? So, and so this S curve doesn't always mean that people have their Kodak moment and completely disappear from this world, but they might might may just be involved in M and A activity, uh, so that there are fewer companies overall in the industry and. Uh, you know, to a certain extent, we see that in, 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 in part of the insurance industry, which is reinsurance, where diversification on a global scale is really the, uh, you know, the, 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 the main motive. Uh, and there we only have very few players uh, on, on the world scale that can actually offer that. So we have a, an oligopolistic structure in, in that industry. So I think consolidation will happen, but a percentage is really hard, is really hard to, to name, right? Thank you, Alex. Um, looking at what you just said, where can small and medium-sized companies uh, find their place in, in this ecosystem, which needs very high investments? Uh, mm -hmm. They all uh, undergo consolidation <laughs> or other places? Um, well, not necessarily. I mean, there there is. Um, I think there are benefits to uh, having a clear, making a clear decision, uh, and one decision could be: look, um, I'm absolutely not in a position because of resources and previous market position to actually achieve that uh, orchestrator role, right? So then one way could be, you know, concentrate on the digitization of the value chain, the APIs that you need and become really very good at delivering products into ecosystems of other uh, industries or you know other orchestrators and there, there are examples um, out there I have one from China and there's a digital insurance company called Zhongan it's actually a, a subsidiary a joint venture founded by uh, Ping An which we talked about in 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 the slides but also Tencent and Alibaba which are you know the the Chinese version uh, I would say of probably Google or Alphabet and and Amazon and their main role is they are a simple provider of services into ecosystems of, of other players. They were never founded with a different intention and they're highly automated uh, and, 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 and operate with a highly efficient cost structure. And this could be something that you may be able to achieve uh, if you focus um, you know, on, that, on that digitization effort. And at the same time, you could experiment, right? You could try to place a couple of bets uh, with business model innovation uh, and, you know, and, and try that option as well. Thank you. Um, looking at the healthcare industry, do you think that could be an opportunity for health insurance companies to build a patient ecosystem? Yeah, healthcare is actually a very interesting example uh, because it's one of the few business lines, I would say, where insurers really have a potential role to play as an orchestrator, um, simply because if you look at the other players that are adjacent to, to the health insurance industry, such as you know hospitals, uh, doctor practices, uh, pharmaceutical companies, 
uh, and you know institutions that uh, care for um, for injured people or, or, or sick people, then I think insurance like health insurance companies really are uh, in this case don't face a clear opponent that has much more capabilities in becoming an orchestrator. So I, I guess the race is more open there. And uh, if the insurance companies in that business have a good concept, it may well be achievable there. Because interestingly, in health, people tend to turn to their insurer as well in, in, in certain cases already today to get advice. Uh, and many health insurers have realized that and have started already to build this, you know, customer-centric ecosystem providing much more than just health insurance, you know, providing advice with, with regard to your diet, you know, uh, providing advice with how you should live in an active uh, and physically engaging uh, way and so forth. And I think that's a very interesting uh, example to name where, uh, you know, th th there, there is a certain chance indeed that an insurer may be able to build such a platform. Thank you. Um Looking at the financial industry and fintechs, would you say the insurance industry is ahead or behind on the digitalization curve? Looking at new incumbents, speed of adapting regulations, the new business models, and so on. Do you see similarities between both industries in that transformation process? Yeah, well, fintech and insurtech are um, essentially could be considered to be the same sector, uh, whereas insurtech is usually, the, you know, um, is a subsector of the broader fintech space. And uh, a lot of concepts um, are usually, you know, appear first in the fintech space and then sort of later on appear in the insurtech space. Uh, for example, uh, those peer-to-peer -peer lending platforms that we see a lot already in, uh, you know, trying to substitute the lending business of banks. Uh, we don't have that in insurance yet. Doesn't mean that it's not gonna come or pop up in insurance as well. So uh, yes, I think that FinTech uh, in the narrow sense being solutions for startup solutions for the banking space are usually a little, a little bit ahead of the curve and then insurtechs follow. Um, and so it may really be insightful to look at what's going on in the fintech sector and try to anticipate what's next in, in insurance and insurtech there, right? So, and, and there are some models that I have to say uh, in, in fintech, particularly the peer-to-peer the -peer landing platforms that I mentioned that really have to be taken into account. I think in the future, that is really a major force because they are attacking uh, a core part of the banking business trying to match people who have saved money with people who want to borrow money uh, and taking the intermediary out of the chain, right? They directly match capital, uh, you know, demand for capital with supply of capital without having a bank sitting in, in the middle. And now you may say, well, they're all small and there are no significant force yet and, and so forth, but you should look at the growth figures of these platforms, right? And, uh, and, and, and um, combine that with other Fintech such as Revolut, which is a, um, you know, a payment transaction service. Um, you, you could call it a, a digital bank. It's just an app. It doesn't have brick and mortar, uh, brick and mortar uh, banking retail network. Uh, but they are very good in doing payments uh, and exchange rates. And if you combine all that, you know, banks can really be decomposed in their major functions. And all these major functions can be taken over by, by real competitors from the fintech space. And um, that's not completely unrealistic. Um, it's more diff it's a, a little bit more difficult in the insurance industry, but for us in the insurance industry, that tells us we have to be really uh, aware uh, of what's going on because models like that may well come over uh, to our industry in the near future. Thank you. Um, Alex, you mentioned about being digital culturally as well. What are some of your recommendations for getting there, getting the right culture? Yeah, I mean, that, that's also a difficult question. It's, it's probably one of the most challenging questions that uh, these um, s sort of companies from, let's say, classical industries are facing. Um, so how do you transform? I think one important point is start with the tangible uh, environment. It may sound completely trivial, right? But look at your offices. How, they, how do they look, right? So if you want a, a digital culture, it starts with the environment that you are actually working in. And uh, look at Stromberg's offices in the capital, the hypothetical uh, capital insurance. You know, do you think that this is something that a, uh, a really a digital culture can thrive in? Not so sure, right? 
and many insurers have actually understood that. So, and I think we are, you know, a lot of insurance companies are at the forefront uh, in changing the tangible office environment in which people work as a, a clear signal. Look, uh, you know, because it, there, there's a saying cluttered desk, cluttered mind, right? So get rid of all this old stuff, um, make it a new environment, uh, a really, envir uh, really an environment that matches what we are expect to see in the 21st century. And that's the first step, it's a very strong signal. And then you can add on top of that, you know, uh, do uh, coachings, you know, executive education seminars, webinars actually, I think is a good way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, and and other things, right? Uh, try to um, you know have internal there are several several things you know internal idea pitches, uh, and try to establish something of that innovation spirit in the everyday life uh, of your company. So don't just sit in classical meetings, uh, but try to uh, you know look left and right what people do in the tech industry um, uh, to actually enrich uh, your, your culture with that. And, and then in the end, there will certainly be some people who cannot change anymore because they have been in the business for too long or don't want to change. And then you'll have to see uh, how, how it goes with them, right? So uh, whether you can requalify them um, or at some point, you know, the number of uh, positions in certain areas, uh, for example, if automation comes into underwriting and claims handling, it's pretty clear that you will need less people um, to do that job, right? So, but then on the other hand, you will have more people in, in IT development and, and in data science. Right? Uh, last thing that I want to mention is, right, if you get these people from the outside, it can help as well, right? If you, even if it's just a few of them, start with a cell and then try to bring them in contact with your old employees as often as as you can to, you know, Get, get that momentum going and and hope for spillover effects in culture as well. But it's difficult, I admit that. Relating to this and beyond technology, do you see a shift of qualification of people working in multi-handed organizations? What capabilities do they have? Yeah, that's uh, we're actually looking into this with the Swiss Insurance Association these days. We have a study going on where we think about the, the skill shift that we will experience in the insurance industry. And I think what we had, what we have to stop is to look at CVs and just say, oh, look, this guy has worked in claims, so he's a claims guy, and he will continue to work in claims for, for you know, until the bitter end, you know, judgment day. And we will have to see much more what skills people have. And a CV doesn't, necess doesn't necessarily tell that at first glance, uh, but there are tools, right? So there are bots out there. I've uh, met with someone from a large Swiss insurance company in the HR department. They're starting to use uh, AI to go through CVs and translate the, uh, you know, the, the entries and the items you have in your CV into actual skills. So someone from claims or underwriting may actually be very good with analytics. So uh, he may be a, a person who is not afraid of getting in touch with numbers, uh, may, because of other, other things that you see on the CV, may actually be a person that is really flexible, really agile, um, you know, fast learner, all these kind of things. And you can identify that and then try, you know, look beyond the underwriter, look beyond the claims handling agent and see what the person actually can do. And could do in a completely different role with a little bit of a learning curve at the beginning. And I guess that's, that's the way to go in the future. Stop, think in job pro, uh, stop thinking in job profiles and think in skills. Um, and, you know, I, I believe a lot of our companies have hidden skills that can be discovered like that and can be used to the advantage in this multi-handed setup uh, that, that we discussed in, in the presentation. Thank you. And here's a remark from my side. At five today, we have a webinar on recruiting in the digital age. So that might actually uh, answer some of your questions. <laughs> yes, yeah, a perfect link. <laughs> um, here's one question or, or comment, actually. Um, even big German insurance companies are not aware of the sharing economy at all. Instead, they fight against it. For example, they terminated terminated all my car insurances as I offered one car on a sharing platform. How can companies stay tuned to what's happening outside? Yeah, that's, I mean, um, that's a, a very bad example. I mean, that shouldn't 
that shouldn't happen, right? Uh, this is something that you can clearly see. That's the question of mindset, right? This is this has nothing to do with the digital value chain. That that is a digital mindset that is missing, uh, exactly there. Because you should adopt, uh, you know, these new concepts, sharing and access. They they are going to be the future. So you should adopt them and embrace them instead of fighting them, right? So that there's no point in trying to fight. It's like, you know, in the 90s when people thought about fighting globalization, there's no point, you know, you have to think about how to adapt to that changing environment. Um, and it astonishes me that this was a, a large German insurance company. Um, I know other examples also from the German uh, insurance sector where companies are really already building into that ecosystem mobility and trying to be, you know, probably not an orchestrator, but at least a very, uh, very important player in, in on the participant side, uh, trying to actually tap into the secondhand car market platforms, sharing platforms, becoming a part of it, you know, becoming part of a consortium that is uh, trying to build a mobility platform could be one option, right? So why not think about joining BMW uh, and Mercedes in their efforts? They have merged car to go and, and drive now into a bigger concept, trying to build a mobility platform. Why not approach them early on, try to be a strategic partner in building that platform, have a say from the start, instead of trying to fight these models by canceling insurance contracts. Thank you. One last question. Um, going back to the initial topic of insurance companies, uh, how, uh, health insurance, how can insurance companies win the battle for patient data against big pharma and big tech and do they even have to? I think the interesting part is in the the, the the health insurance industry has a lot of patient data already. I think it's more of a question, what are you actually allowed to use? Because as a, as a health insurance company, you see everything, right? You see everything because the, the, the customer is going to go and, uh, you know, see his doctor and he has a stay in the hospital and you get the bills. And there's a list of everything that has happened, right? So you can, from those, from those documents, you can infer virtually everything that has happened to the patient. And if you track that over an extended period of time, uh, you have a complete history, a medical history of, of, your, of your customer. I think the question is more that from both a legal and an ethical perspective, how much are you allowed to tap into that data? And uh, from my discussion with industry professionals, um, it's at this point, uh, it's, it's not entirely clear, right? Uh, so for, for some usages, uh, the, the health insurers are still handcuffed, right? So they can't use that data for everything. And I guess it's a key way going forward is to try and figure out uh, what of this uh, very valuable data can you use and maybe um, how to get consent from your customers by showing them that there is a certain benefit uh, because if you want to use that data, you will have to show the customer that, you know, he benefits in some shape or form. Because otherwise he would say, look, this is private information that you, ha you have because you need, to, you need to have it to handle a claim. But other than that, I don't want you to make, make use of it at all, right? So, uh, so I think it's, it, the fact is they have the data, <laughs> it's hard to use it. So thank you so much, Alex. We were actually able to answer all questions. If you have more questions, uh, I'm sure you can get in touch with Alex as well. Um, Anytime. Very insightful, thank you. Um, two announcements, or oh, one announcement from my side. Hope you will join our two remaining webinars of the Digital Week. And we have put, off, uh, put together a super short-term webinar on Friday on the coronavirus and what it means from a legal perspective uh, as an employee, as an employer um, for um, the Swiss legal context. We have three law professors from the University of St. Gallen, four actually um, discussing here. So um, go to our website. We just put it on the website. If that's interesting to you, it would be great to see you there as well. And um, do you have any final remarks, Alex? No, thank you very much. Um, I think it was an exciting lunch break. Um, I really enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining in and hope to see you all again soon. Thank you. So have a nice afternoon, everybody. <laughs>